Hello and welcome. It's 10 a.m. on Monday, the 9th of June. You're tuned into our mid morning newscast here on Adidang TV. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. President Park Geun-hye is widely expected to name a new Prime Minister nominee sometime today. The President, who will also carry out a cabinet reshuffle, wants to breathe new life into her reform plans following last week's local elections. With April's Sewol Ho ferry disaster still affecting the nation, the government is considering whether, it, whether to lower its economic growth outlook for this year. Plus, the terrorist attack on Karachi Airport is now over. Around 20 people have been killed, including security personnel and civilians. Ten terrorists were among the dead. But our top story this morning, with last week's local elections done and dusted, President Park Geun-hye is expected to push ahead with her much-anticipated reshuffle of the cabinet and her presidential office aides. A new prime minister nominee could be, de could be named today as well. Our Kim Min-ji starts us off. President Park Geun-hye will likely announce her pick to fill the vacant prime minister's seat as early as this Monday. With the local elections out of the way, the president is expected to speed up the cabinet reshuffle in response to public criticism of the government's lax handling of April's ferry disaster. Sources say President Bach has been searching for a candidate with an innovative mind and ethical integrity. This comes after our previous prime minister nominee, Ahn he withdrew last month amid criticism over the amount of money he earned in the private sector after retiring as a Supreme Court justice. 국가 개혁의 적임자로 국민들께서 요구하고 있는 분을 찾고 있습니다. The president has been mulling over potential candidates as she seeks to press ahead with her reform agenda. Among the candidates under consideration are Kim Young Nan, former head of the Anti-Corruption and Civil Rights Commission, as well as Cho Mu Jae, a former Supreme Court justice. With the ruling Senuri party failing to grab winning tickets from the Chungcheongdo provinces at the local elections, candidates from these provinces are also being considered, including Shim Dae Pyeong, the chairman of the Presidential Committee on Local Autonomy Development. A reshuffle is also imminent at the presidential office. President Park on Sunday tapped Yoon Doo Hyun as the new senior presidential press secretary after a close aide stepped down from the post as he's reportedly considering running in a by election next month. Yoon, the head of YTN Plus, a digital contents provider, was noted by the presidential office for his balanced way of thinking and sharp analytical skills as a journalist. Yoon was appointed as he's the right person to explain government reform policies to the public and receive their understanding and cooperation. A review process is also underway for other presidential aides to be replaced. Kim min -ji, Arirang News. Now to some sad news. Another Korean survivor of Japan's military sexual slavery has passed away. Bae Chun Hee died at the age of 91, according to the House of Sharing on Sunday. The group runs a shelter for women who were forced into sexual slavery for Japanese troops during World War II. Bae's death leaves only 54 surviving victims in the country. Initially, there were 237 women on the list of government registered former sex slaves. Historians estimate that up to 200,000 so-called comfort women, mostly from Korea and China, were forced into sexual slavery during the war. Korea has been demanding Tokyo apologize to and compensate the victims. T uh, Japan says the issue was resolved through a bilateral treaty in 1965 that normalized ties between the two countries. Now, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is speeding up efforts to get cabinet approval on the issue of collective self-defense, a reinterpretation of the constitution that will allow Japan to militarily assist allies that come under attack. Japanese Daily Asai Shimbun reported Sunday that Abe has reportedly instructed senior officials to prepare for cabinet approval before the session ends on June 22nd. Following his orders, a senior Ruling Liberal pa Democratic Party leader asked government officials to prepare a draft of the constitutional reinterpretation. Abe has also ordered his Liberal Democratic Party to quickly reach an agreement with new Komato, its ruling coalition partner, which has been at odds with Abe over his push to revamp 
the country's defense policy. And staying with Japan, and Tokyo has presented North Korea with a list of roughly 470 Japanese nationals it believes were abducted by Pyongyang decades ago. Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshihide Suga says the list has been sent to North Korea through a diplomatic channel. The move is part of a recent agreement under which Pyongyang will reinvestigate the whereabouts of missing Japanese nationals, and they'll do so in exchange for sanctions relief. Suga said Tokyo will send officials to North Korea after the reinvestigation to verify the results. He added Tokyo will continue intergovernmental talks with Pyongyang on this issue, even if North Korea carries out nuclear or missile tests. Now, some controversial statements have been made by a researcher in the United States. She is calling on South Korea, the US and China to engage in trilateral talks on reunifying the two Koreas. Al Kim Hyun-bin reports. Sumi Terry, a senior researcher with the Weatherhead East Asian Institute at Columbia University, says that South Korea, the US and China need to engage in active discussion on the future of reunified Korea. Terry, a former director of Korea, Japan and Oceanic Affairs at the National Security Council, made the remarks at a congressional hearing last week. Terry said that in order to change China's policy on North Korea, Seoul and Washington need to convince Beijing that Korean reunification will be beneficial for the country. She added that the U.S. needs to promise not to dispatch its troops north of the border after reunification is achieved. She also went as far as to say that the U.S. should consider pulling its troops out of Korea entirely to win Beijing support, saying that this would ease China's security concerns and could encourage Beijing to put more pressure on North Korea. She said the move would not be a diplomatic policy failure for Washington, as U.S. troops were first stationed on the peninsula to defend South Korea after the Korean War. Kim Hyun-bin, Adidas News. Rescue divers have recovered one more body from the sunken Sewolho ferry, and they did so on Sunday evening. This raises the confirmed death toll from the disaster to 292. The government's disaster response headquarters said a male body was retrieved from the fourth floor of the sunken vessel. A female body was also recovered earlier on the same day. Divers have been searching that part of the ship based on testimony given by crew members during their ongoing investigation into the disaster. 55 days since the sinking, the number of missing stands at 12. Get connected to Korea and the world. Join us every weekday for the latest developments out of Korea, Asia and beyond. On air, on your mobile and online, we lead the way every day. Arirang News. To try and resolve the crisis in Ukraine, the European Union also offers 15 billion Now the Sewolho ferry had a huge human cost of course, but the ferry disaster is also taking a toll on the Korean economy. It's dented domestic demand and is prompting the government to consider actually lowering its growth outlook for this year. Our Connie Kim reports. With April's deadly ferry disaster affecting the whole nation, the government is reviewing whether to adjust the economic growth outlook for this year. The finance ministry said Sunday that it's assessing economic activity in the first half of the year as it reviews its predictions for the latter half. The ministry is planning to release its economic policy direction for the second half of the year later this month. The ministry says that its policies will focus on supporting the service sector and small businesses in light of the Seoul ferry disaster. Now, the ministry's plans are expected to include tax breaks and employment subsidies, though the amount of support has not yet been determined. The ministry says the measures will be geared toward boosting domestic demand and improving people's livelihoods. The government last year predicted a growth rate of 3.9 percent for this year. However, a state-run research institute says it is highly unlikely the government can achieve that due to sluggish domestic consumption. Last month, the Korea Development Institute, a government think tank, lowered its growth forecast to 3.7 percent. Connie Kim, Arirang News.
Now, staying with some economic news, latest reports show business investment in Korea rose in the first three months of this year, mainly due to increased spending by a number of the nation's top conglomerates. According to Corporate Watcher CEO score on Sunday, Korea's top 30 conglomerates invested about 20 billion US dollars in the first quarter. That's nearly 9% higher than the same period last year. But if we put aside Korea's biggest business group, Samsung, which boosted its investment by 48%, the rest actually invested about 4% less than they did in the first quarter of 2013. Now, Korean mobile messaging service Line has reached another milestone. 450 million registered users and it's aiming for more by the year's end. The subsidiary of Korean search engine giant Naver says it attracted 30 million users in May alone. Line currently has 24 million users in Thailand, 20 million in Taiwan and 20 million as well in Indonesia. Looking a bit further afield, it has 15 million users in Spain, 10 million in Mexico and 50, 50 million in Japan. Line has set a year-end goal of 500 million users and there are rumours the company is reviewing an IPO with a dual US and Japanese listing. The estimated valuation of Line is in the range of $10 billion. Facebook paid $19 billion for WhatsApp, a service very similar to Line. Now the World Cup kicks off in Brazil in just a few days' time and Koreans are well known around the world for their feverish support of their team. Although everything is ready for people to enjoy the games, festivities are likely to be toned down this year, not only because of the very early start times, but of course in the wake of the recent ferry disaster. Paulie explains. Here in the capital, Seoul, many sports retailers are unusually quiet despite the World Cup being just around the corner. Large advertisement banners and over-the-top promotional events have been absent from storefronts. It's part of a conscious choice by many football fans and businesses to tone down celebrations as the country continues to deal with a shock and grief from April's Sewoho ferry sinking. The atmosphere was really great during the World Cup four years ago. But even with a few days left with the World Cup, there's no atmosphere of excitement. Many people don't feel like it's the World Cup. Official corporate sponsors of the upcoming World Cup are also adjusting their marketing campaigns in Korea to reflect public sentiment. For example, many are using televised ads with gentler music and subdued visuals. Given the recent national sentiment, we're proceeding with a calmer tone. Our TV advertisements are colorful and have a lively atmosphere. However, we're moving forward with a message that has a softer mood. Major department store chains are also taking a different approach, with World Cup-themed fashion shows and cartoon exhibitions featuring famous South American artists. As you know, there are many people who are suffering from the Seoro disaster. Through this exhibition, we want to give people a chance to heal and support each other. The opening match for the World Cup will kick off on June 12, while Korea will face off against Russia in their first match on June 17. But unlike in past years, the official supporters group, the Red Devils, won't be launching large-scale rallies through the streets of Seoul. Nonetheless, millions of fans at home and abroad will be cheering on the Korean men's national team, albeit with a heavy heart. Paul Yi, Arirang News. Now, installing solar panels can make your home more energy efficient and your energy bills that much more cheaper. But the setup costs make it unaffordable for many homeowners. Local companies have come up with what they say is an easy way to lease out the equipment, even to those who cannot afford the really rather hefty initial investment. Our Son Jung In has this report. From the bright lights in the living room to the air conditioner and TV, all these home appliances are running on energy provided from a solar panel on the roof of the house. But the installation doesn't come cheap, with an average cost of seven to eight thousand U.S. dollars. In order to lessen the burden for homeowners, solar companies came up with so-called solar panel rental program. 
Under the lease agreement, they can borrow the equipment for under $70 a month. Last summer, we ran the air conditioner all season, and the monthly electricity bill came to around $1,000. But after we installed the solar panel, we are now paying just one-fifth of the usual bill. The Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy says homeowners that pay an average $100 for electricity a month can save up to $15 every month, even after paying the rental and electricity fees. If you sign up for the sunlight panel rental service, we set the facility up for free. The rental period covers the costs of any repairs and maintenance so you can save more money. Only non-apartment building houses that are well insulated and are not facing the south are currently eligible for the service. The government plans to promote ways for the one and a half million houses qualified to benefit from the lease program so they can save both the planet and money. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Time now for a look through the international headlines we're following this morning. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim, who's standing by at the News Centre. Good morning, Eunice. Good morning, Mark. Now it seems the siege on Karachi airport has come to an end. That's right, Mark. After five hours of terror, the strike on Pakistan's Jinnah International Airport, which services the country's largest city of Karachi, is over. Early reports show there were no traveler casualties, though two airline employees were among the dead. This according to CNN, which cited hospital officials. The total number of casualties vary at the moment from at least 13 to as many as 23. What we do know is there were several deaths coming out of this attack turned shootout, most of them security officials and militants. Now, hundreds of police, army and special forces engaged Engaged the at least six militants that stormed the busy airport through three entrances before midnight local time, armed with grenades. One of them is said to have blown himself up near a armored vehicle, leaving those inside critically injured. We'll bring you a complete report in our next newscast at noon. And at the Vatican, a first. Pope Francis hosted the presidents of Israel and Palestine for a special prayer for peace in the region. The meeting came to fruition two weeks after the pontiff extended the invitation during his visit to the Holy Land and as U.S. brokered peace talks between the two sides had cooled. Pope Francis said peacemaking calls for courage, much more so than warfare, and called on leaders to say yes to encounter and no to conflict. Prayers were said in the Jewish, Christian and Muslim faiths during the sunset event. The three leaders also planted an olive tree in a symbolic sign of peace. Local media in Thailand are reporting key red shirt activists have agreed to talks with the interim military government, marking progress in the first of the junta's three-stage plan for reconciliation. Meanwhile, the National Council for Peace and Order has lifted curfews at four additional tourist destinations in an apparent move to reboot tourism in Thailand. That's Cha'am, Hua Hin, Krabi and Phang Nga, sites popular for their beaches. This follows last week's curfew removals in the resort cities of Pattaya, Samui and Phuket. Bangkok and Chiang Mai, meanwhile, remain under orders to close down between the hours of midnight and 4 a.m., as is the case in non-tourism-related provinces. And finally, in the U.S., former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has said she will make a decision on a potential 2016 presidential bid by the end of the year. She said she likely won't make it public, though, until next year, as she would mull over the prospect until then. She made the statement during an interview with U.S. broadcaster ABC News, during which she also pitched her new book, Hard Choices, to be published on Tuesday. The former, uh, the popular former first lady leads in polls for possible Democratic candidates in the 2016 presidential election.
And a good Monday morning to you all as we kick things off in the LPGA with the Manulife Financial LPGA Classic. And just a week after losing our number one ranking, South Korea's Park Bi comes back to her old self and gets closer to taking her top ranking once again. Despite a decent first round of the event, shooting a 69, Park Bi improves every day until she ends up shooting an amazing 61 on the final day to pass everyone and finish with their first LPGA title of the season at 23 under par overall. With their putting game improving a lot since missing cut not too long ago, she was able to come back and claim the Manulife Financial LPGA Classic. Meanwhile, world number one Stacey Lewis finished tied for sixth at 15 under par overall. And now moving over to the South Korean national team with the team currently training for the upcoming tune-up match against Ghana. Former national team head coach Gus Hiddink said some, had something to say about the upcoming World Cup and it wasn't all that motivating. According to the legendary head coach who once led the South Korean national team to their fourth place finish back in 2002, he believes it's too bad that Korea had to be grouped into Group H with Belgium and Russia. Henning believes that both nations are tough teams to beat and should do very well in the World Cup. Meanwhile, Belgium, Russia and Algeria have yet to lose in their tune-up matches, including Belgium who defeated Tunisia 1-0 over the weekend. And now moving over to the KBO where the LG Twins crushed the Kia Tigers 20-3 on Sunday with the Lotte Giants shutting out the SK Wyverns 3-0 and the Tucson Bears end their six-game losing streak with a six-run ninth inning beating the Nexon Heroes 11-9. Meanwhile, let's take a look at the highlights between Samsung Lions and the Hanwha Eagles. Of course, going into the game, here we go over to the second inning. Kim Hung Gonier bunts one to third, but an error scores Park Sung Min from third, and it's 1 0. Next batter, Lee Ji Young, this time an RBI single to left field, and it's now 2 0. Next play, base is loaded for Navarro, and he draws the work here, and it's 3 0. Still bases loaded. Park Han is going to ground one to a double play, but Lee Ji Young scores, and it's now 4 0. Shifting to the fifth inning, Kim Tae Gil with the man on, and there it goes. Deep to right field, gone a two run shot, and it's four to two. Meanwhile, these Samsung Lions continue to swing away, scoring three runs in the seventh inning as they hang on to win this game, seven to two. And now moving over to game two of the NHL Stanley Cup Finals, where despite being down 4-2 in the third quarter, the LA Kings come back to score twice in the third to tie the game 4-4 before. Dustin Brown scoring the second overtime to beat the New York Rangers 5-4. Now with the win, the Kings now have a 2-0 series lead over the Rangers. Meanwhile, we're going to finish things off with the French Open where Maria Sharapova was able to beat Simona Halep in three sets to claim her second French Open title and her fifth Grand Slam title in an emotional victory. Meanwhile, Rafael, Rafael Nadal proved to be the king of clay courts as he defeated Novak Djokovic in four sets, claiming his ninth French Open title and his 14th Grand Slam title overall. And with that, that's going to do it for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning. Well, unlike somewhat cool and breezy conditions we had yesterday, it will get hotter again today. Temperatures reaching into the upper 20s in most areas. In fact, the western parts of the region will have a hot day, while the eastern region will see cooler readings in the afternoon, hovering in the mid to low 20s. And outbreaks of rain is forecasted in some of the regions in Gyeonggi-do and Gangwon-do during the day. Actually, we are expecting on and off rain through 
throughout the week, and it seems like today should be the hottest day of the week as the temperatures will drop each day from now on and remain below 30 degrees Celsius here in Seoul. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. The low in morning, uh, morning low in most areas are starting out at 18, then the high in the capital in Gwangju will rise to 29, while Daegu tops out at 27 and Busan should climb to 24 later on. For other regions, uh, down in Jeju should see a high of 24, the Dunan Dokdo will reach 29 and and 19 respectively, while Mount Kungang tops out at 15. That's all for now. Have a wonderful day, and I'll be back with more updates afternoon. Well, thank you very much for the weather there, Gian, and that's all we have for you for now, but we'll be back with another newscast at noon Korea time. Until then, goodbye.